Welcome to the Witte Museum Conference. We're really excited to be here and thinking about resilience in Texas as we virtually present a wonderful panel entitled Raise Your Chin, Space the Fight, the Rest of the Women's Suffrage Story. And I'm Katherine Clinton, the Denman Professor of American History at University of Texas San Antonio. And I'm excited to be here today with a very distinguished scholar of Texas women's history, and that is Nancy Baker Jones, who will be speaking to us and then we'll have a conversation afterwards. But Nancy is a founding president of the Ruth Weingarten Foundation for Texas Women's History in Austin. She and Weingarten wrote Capital Women, Texas Female Legislators, 1923 to 1999, and she's taught women's history at St. Edwards University. Her publications include The Way We Were, Gender and the Women's Pavilion, Hemisphere 68, published in the Southwestern Historical Quarterly, and Making Texas Our Texas, The Emergence of Texas Women's History, 1976 to 1990. She's a fellow of the Texas State Historical Association and a board member, a book review editor for the SHQ, and an advisor to a forthcoming documentary about the women's suffrage movement in Texas. And we're very pleased to have her talk on this very timely subject of women's suffrage in historical perspective. Thank you, Nancy. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here with you. Um, we're here to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. In order to do that, what I'd like to divide this into is about five sections. We're gonna start with the context in the United States for suffrage. And then we're going to, um, especially concentrating on the Constitution itself. Then we're gonna talk about the context in Texas for suffrage. And um, third, we're then going to talk about the role of women in color, women of color in the suffrage movement um, in Texas in particular. And that will lead us then to, um, that will then lead us to actually talking about the white movement in Texas. The suffrage movement in Texas was populated primarily by white women. And there are reasons for that. So we're going to talk about that. And then we'll finish up with two aspects of the suffrage movement that may be new to you. Um, so let me say again that uh, we're starting here with uh, thinking about the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. It's a legality that we now take for granted as a guarantee of our rights. And we understand that now that there's a tight link between citizenship and the vote. Um, in the early constitution, however, there was no definition of citizenship and no clear link between citizenship and voting. And that was a problem. And one of the things that actually propelled people into deciding that they needed to agitate in order to, have, to get the vote. Um, People then thought in terms of laws of nature, which taught them that women and children and black people were subservient to, were not the equals of elite white men. And so it was those elite white men who counted in the first constitution, so to speak. Uh, and they were the first group of people who had the vote. Now, the people who were not included in the early constitution knew that, they understood it. You, we remember Abigail Adams, um, who told her husband John to remember the ladies. Um, but she also followed that by saying, if you don't, we're going to foment a rebellion. And that's essentially what happened among women in the United States. Of course, African-Americans um, had been enduring slavery for almost 170 years by the time the Constitution was enacted. And so they certainly understood very well that they weren't included in it. And so the whole notion of the abolition movement was in part uh, arose because of this need and um, there were women who also identified with the abolition movement because they in identified with enslaved people and their lack of rights. So by 1848, enough feminists and abolitionists, white and black, believed in the need for civil rights for all women uh, that they called a convention in Seneca Falls, New York, um, in order to talk about equal rights. And they declared that there were 16, at least 16 rights that all women deserved. And one of those was the right to vote. Uh, these, these were biracial bi groups of abolitionists and feminists who cooperated through the Civil War. And the two biggest names in that coalition 
were Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a prominent white woman, and the former slave, Frederick Douglass. Now, after the Civil War was over, they got a lot of what they wanted. They got the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery, and then the 14th Amendment, which declared that anyone who was born in the United States or naturalized here was a citizen, and that included freed people. So that meant that African Americans were citizens, and so were women. This amendment, the 14th, also said that male citizens could vote. And that was a curiosity for a lot to, for a lot of people because that was the first time the word male appeared in the Constitution. There were some women actually who thought that they could vote as a result of that. And they attempted a number of times until the Supreme Court finally decided and declared that just because women were citizens, that didn't mean they had the right to vote. They also got, after the war, the 15th Amendment, which specifically granted the vote to African Americans. Now, when some white women realized that African American men had been granted the vote before white women had, that biracial coalition essentially blew up. And in 1869, it split into two separate groups, one of which favored the vote for African Americans African-American men in specific, and the other, uh, which was led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, which, having been offended by the 15th Amendment, declared that they thought only educated white women should have the vote. So they split into these two competing groups instead of collaborating. Um, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton's idea was that um, educated white woman suffrage was preferable over African-American male suffrage because white women were superior to African-American men. She often talked about educated, refined women, which was code for white, and the lower orders of men, which was code for black people. Now she and Susan B. Anthony are going to lead the nationwide suffrage movement one of these days, and they're going to carry those views along with them. So that's the basics about what was happening in the United States and setting the stage for what's happening in Texas. By, if we wanna to go to 1848 in Texas, um, Texas was now a state. However, its history in becoming a state was tied very closely to the desire for slavery. So the original Texans were people who came from the American South with their slaves and they established a colony in Mexico thinking that they could create what some historians have called an empire for slavery. When that didn't work out because Mexico objected, they revolted. They set up a republic in which slavery was legal. And when the republic could no longer support itself, they be Texans became a state and they were a slave state. And at each of those steps along the way, what Texans did were, was to produce a constitution. And in those constitutions, as a republic and as a state, they declared that slavery was legal, and they allowed only Anglos to be citizens, and they allowed only white men to vote. And then about a decade later, of course, they seceded with the Confederacy from the United States over slavery, with the hope that these Confederate states could form a new country in which slavery would be legal. And that, of course, didn't work. And after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, Texas had to re, uh, rewrite its constitution one more time in order to get back into the Union. And that first time was in 1868, when because during Reconstruction there was reform in the air, um, someone had suggested that perhaps women should be enfranchised. Now, that was one of the goals of Reconstruction, was to create a new place where civil rights were available for everybody, regardless of their color. Um, However, that suggestion in 1868 did not carry. It was defeated. And in fact, there would be nine more times in Texas when the idea of woman suffrage would come out between then and 1918, and, they would, and it would fail each of those times. So this was really an important effort, a difficult effort in Texas um, to achieve suffrage for women. So what we have to understand is what the life was like during Reconstruction in Texas. Most whites in Texas were Democrats and they had supported slavery and the Confederacy. And they didn't like reconstruction because they didn't want black men to vote. And they sure didn't want white women voting 
that black men voted. They didn't want reconstruction. What they wanted was the restoration of the society as it had existed before the Civil War, when they had been in charge of the <clears throat> society. You'll recall that the 13th Amendment outlawed slavery. However, it left this enormous loophole that suggested and allowed for, for African-Americans to be re-enslaved or to um, be put into conditions of servitude involuntarily if they committed crimes. And so a lot of what the Southern states did, including Texas, was to immediately initiate a series of black codes, which pretty much made illegal almost every aspect of any kind of freedom that African-Americans had in their lives. So when the new Texas Constitution came up at the end of Reconstruction in 1876, it was called the Redeemer Constitution because those white Southern Democrats had fought the reforms of Reconstruction the entire way, and they got a lot of what they wanted at the end of Reconstruction. Women were not even mentioned in the Constitution, and what they reinstituted was a world that came to be known as Jim Crow. It was actually apartheid. It was segregated, it was authoritarian, it was essentially a racial caste system based on the values of paternalism and white male supremacy that had existed before the Civil War. It was often ruled legally by outlaws and vigilantes and the Ku Klux Klan who behaved as terrorists and um, in essentially kept the peace by preventing anyone who uh, was black from having equal rights. Now, at this time, states controlled all aspects of voting, and that's a really important thing to remember as we go through this. The Texas uh, Democratic Party enforced this. Even though black uh, voter registration had skyrocketed during Reconstruction, African-American men were disfranchised after Reconstruction even though the 15th Amendment existed. They simply had the vote taken away from them. And one historian from Texas has said that the woman suffrage movement would not have even been possible at all if black men had been allowed to vote because white men did not want any racial mixing at the polls or anywhere else. So the reality was that white Texas suffragists could not support suffrage for black women if they wanted the vote themselves. White women were excluded from party power, obviously, but they had the benefit of being white. And so they had access to the white men who were in power. By 1903, 1902, I'm sorry, the Texas government had instituted the whites only primary. By 1903, the poll tax followed. And the woman suffrage bill that finally passed in the Texas legislature in 1918 applied only to their right to vote in the white primary, so it was limited. So that sets the stage for the whites only world in Texas and helps us to understand now what the role of women of color was during the suffrage movement that will emerge in Texas. The fact that Texas was segregated didn't mean that women of color didn't want the vote as much as white women did, and that they didn't do as much as they could in that restricted situation to get the vote. Um, but they were on their own because there was, were little to no opportunities for collaborating with white women who knew it was not in their interest to work with women of color in order to get suffrage. But nevertheless, here's some of what we do know about women of color. Mexican-American suffragists in the early 20th century were middle class, they were well-educated, uh, they were urban, they were part of what was called the gente decente or um, decent people. They had a tradition of forming self-help groups for women's issues as well as for civil rights issues, and they valued a quality called maternalism, which was the same kind of value that African-American and white women had during the progressive period. Uh, of civic housekeeping, of reforming communities and, and uh, in terms of improving the health and the education and the welfare and those values that women uh, considered their own special uh, talents. The best known progressive, uh, Tejana progressive in Texas was Jovita Idar, who was the member of a large, very active family from Laredo. They were journalists. She was also a teacher 
they own newspapers and they were very vocal when they opposed to things, when they, uh, they objected the, to the treatment of Mexican descent people and women. This family um, brought together uh, El Congreso Mexicanista in 1911, which was a conference that urged Mexican descent people to resist oppression on both sides of the border. And it also created a women's group called La Liga Femenil, which was the one of the first feminist groups in Texas. And Jovita Idar became the president of it. In 1914, you probably know the story that she stood in the, stood in the doorway when Texas Rangers tried to shut down the family's newspaper um, because they had been printing articles that were critical of the United States government. In 1916, she and her brother, Eduardo started a newspaper that supported women's suffrage openly and reported on suffrage activism in Texas and the nation. And she wrote for a newspaper in San Antonio called La Prensa. She ran pro-suffrage articles and published the translation of a suffrage pamphlet by the Texas chapter of the National Women's Party. Now, African-American women suffragists have very similar qualities as Tejanas. They are educated, urban, middle-income women who are, who are members of women's clubs and they are active in civil rights issues as well as wanting to vote. They knew they had experienced the fact that African-American men had been denied the vote after they had been awarded it through the 15th Amendment. So their suffrage interests were deeply tied with regaining all civil rights, including votes for women. And they often tied their activism to the NAACP as an important organization when they realized that they were being iced out of the women's suffrage movement and they were going to put their energy into uh, larger areas of civil rights. One of these women was Christia Adair, who worked with Anglos and Tejanas in Kingsville when the Texas primary suffrage bill finally passed in 1918. She and other African-American women tried to vote in 1918, but they were told no. And so Christia Adair turned her attentions to the NAACP in Houston for the rest of her life. Another woman, Maude Sampson Williams, was an African-American woman in um, uh, El Paso. She was the head of a black chapter for suffrage, women's suffrage. And she applied in 1918 to the National Suffrage Organization to become a, an affiliate of them. And uh, Carrie Catt, who was the chair of it at that time, knew that that was not going to happen because African-American women were never allowed to affiliate with the national group. So what she did was ask the, the head of the Texas group, Minnie Fisher Cunningham, to tell Samson that she shouldn't embarrass herself or them by asking for this. And Cunningham was in the middle, but she finally essentially punted. Even though I think she probably would have worked with African-American women, she knew that politically she couldn't do that. And she finally told Samson that they weren't going to be able to get to that issue until probably after the 19th Amendment was already passed. So um, a nice Philip to this story is that Maude Williams and Christia Adair, through their associations with the NAACP, wound up putting their energy into the NAACP and were involved in court cases that eventually would overturn the white primary altogether in about 1944, I believe. So understanding that all kinds of Texas women wanted the vote and worked for it means that we have to reframe the suffrage movement in a new, larger, more inclusive way. The reason that white women were so visible in the historical record is that segregation and white supremacy forced women of color out of the picture and white women actually got the right to vote at their expense. So now we have talked about the, the problem of racism in the movement. Let's talk about the movement itself in Texas as it was run primarily and directed by white women. Progress in Texas towards suffrage was very slow because Texas was big and poor and transportation was hard to get around in. And right after the Civil War, when it might have been possible to talk about it, most white women were probably more interested in recovering from the Civil War, grieving for their losses, and working towards spreading Civil War memorials in, cemetery, in cemeteries and public spaces. But with the spread of the railroads in the 1870s and 80s, 
we finally see urban growth that fosters better education and a more widespread understanding that suffrage is important to all women. And white suffragists actually take to the railroads and take them, ride them to hard to reach places, small towns, where they cause grassroots change. And they get help from new populist groups like the Grange and the People's Party and labor unions, as well as women's clubs, which are teaching them how to organize and advocate for issues and speak in public, which are all good talents for women who are interested in reform movements. And then the Women's Christian Temperance Movement comes to Texas, and it is a very well-funded and widely known organization that is very interested in helping women who are the subjects of abuse from drunken husbands, and that is their particular area of interest. And what they help women, these women in particular, learn how to do is that learn that the vote will give them a voice in improving their lives and their safety in the future. So the WCTU endorses suffrage in 1888. Um, in 1890, those two groups that had split apart in 1869 merged together as one national suffrage group under the leadership of Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who I have said have carried their nativist ideas with them. Um, in 1893, the first statewide suffrage association is created in Texas, but it fails because of a lack of organizational ability. And at this time, the national leaders, so much time has passed by the early part of the 20th century that Elizabeth Cady Stanton dies, Susan B. Anthony dies, and the national movement needs new leadership, which it gets in Carrie Chapman Catt, who shares their racial ideas. Now, at this time, voting in Texas, coming back to Texas, um, was filled with fraud. Only white elite males could vote. No women could vote. And although African-Americans could vote from time to time, if the Republican Party was still active in East Texas, actually didn't make much of a difference. And the Democratic Party stole votes, frankly, and uh, awarded them to the people that they wanted to have them. Another interesting item was that Mexican immigrants who applied to become citizens were allowed to vote. Now, white women who were citizens were not allowed to vote, but Mexican immigrants who could, who did, Good. And the reason for that was that there was a powerful political machine in South Texas of Anglo ranch bosses who controlled Mexican labor. And so what they could do in their own interest was haul these Mexican workers, whether they were citizens or not, off to the polls and arrange in whatever way they wanted by paying their poll taxes or filling out the ballots for them to have those laborers vote for issues that benefited the machine. So you can see that the white power structure is very interested in allowing anyone to vote who can benefit them as long as they can control the voting. And that's the way it worked in Texas. White suffragists are eventually going to catch on to this and they are going to institute in their arguments a desire to disfranchise anybody who is an immigrant. And that includes Mexicans. And during the First uh, World War, it's going to include Germans as well. And they are going to position themselves as superior to these groups and far more worthy of the vote than these groups are. And at the time, the national chair, Carrie Catt, had concluded at the same time that the only group left to focus on in Texas to get um, the vote passed would be elite white women because they wanted to convince the white power structure that um, women who wanted suffrage weren't crazy. They weren't wild women. These were the cream of the crop. These were the elite women who were wealthy, who were well-educated and were well-known in their communities. And so she decided to make suffrage socially acceptable by attracting the right kind of women leaders to the cause in Texas. And of course, what she's wanting to do is to get the states to provide a groundswell of support for suffrage so that the national group can get the 19th Amendment, what becomes the 19th Amendment passed. So it's very, Texas becomes important to them and they visit Texas. And so she came to Texas to convince three women sequentially to serve as the executive director of the Texas Equal Suffrage Association, which was the statewide group. The first of these was Annette Finnegan from Houston, 
The second of these was Eleanor Brackenridge of San Antonio. And finally, the third, and uh, the woman who took suffrage across the finish line was Minnie Fisher Cunningham of Galveston, who took over in 1915. Now, Minnie Fisher Cunningham is a very astute person. She's from an old slaveholding family. And while she's not wealthy anymore, um, she's very well educated. And her father, her father, yeah, had been in the legislature and had mentored her about um, what it was like to be a politician, what it meant to have a success in the legislature. He treated her seriously as a young woman. Um, and so it's important to know also that her mother uh, had never really approved of slavery. And so she instilled in her daughter a desire to treat all people equally. So you have this wonderful, unique combination of qualities in Minnie Fisher Cunningham when she becomes the head of the statewide suffrage movement. <clears throat> in 1917, a resolution supporting woman suffrage in primary uh, elections only came before the legislature again, and it failed. And at this time, this is late in the process, um, she's afraid that suffrage is going to die entirely because the, the governor was Jim Ferguson, who was corrupt. He was very conservative. He was very insulting to women about suffrage. But he got himself in trouble when he launched a political attack against the University of Texas, their progressive faculty, and their um, Board of Regents. And this really upset Minnie Fisher Cunningham because this was her base, so to speak. She needed educated progressive people to spread the word about the importance of suffrage to women and the importance of the spread of the word around the state. So she formed a good government league uh, and campaign and joined with the Ex-Students Association at the University of Texas to publicize the, what Ferguson was doing and they wound up getting him impeached. And waiting in the wings was the more moderate Lieutenant Governor, William P. Hobby. Now he was neither pro-suffrage nor anti-suffrage at the time, but that was great as far as Cunningham was concerned because at least he wasn't virulently anti-suffrage in the way that Ferguson was. So Ferguson made another mistake in 1918 when he decided he was going to run for governor again, even though he had been impeached. And what Cunningham realized was that if she could do, if she could pull this off, she could become a valuable ally of the new governor of Texas. So she went to Hobby and she said, if you will resurrect that dead bill and you will get it passed in the legislature and you will get white women the vote in the white primary, then I swear to you that I will organize those women and they will vote for you for governor and not for Ferguson. And Hobby said, you've got a deal. And then she went to um, a pro-Hobby, pro-suffrage legislator in the House and told him the same thing. If he would, she said, I can't lobby in the, in the legislature because I'm a woman, but you can. And so if you will support this bill, and get it passed, then I will get women suffragists to vote for Hobby, and we won't have trouble with Ferguson anymore. And he said, you bet, I'll do that too. And they did that, and that's how the suffrage bill did pass the House and the Senate in Texas, and Governor Hobby signed the bill. And so, as you can imagine, there was much joy and jubilation in Texas, but this wasn't the end of the story. Cunningham and her suffragists had only 16 days to register women to vote. And so she organized her statewide network and they succeeded in getting 386,000 white women registered to vote in two weeks. And there was no internet then. Now, African-American and Mexican-American women also tried to register to vote, um, but they were denied, of course, because they were the wrong color. So in the end, Hobby did win the governorship in his own right because of the number of votes cast by all those white women who were voting for the first time. And in 1919, when the 19th Amendment came up for a vote in Congress, Texas women were now voters and they understood the leverage that they had as voters. They started a letter writing campaign to those members of the Texas delegation and they said, this is coming up and uh, we expect you to vote for this. We want you to pass the 19th Amendment so it can go out and be ratified by the states and become law. And they did that. 
And then Governor Hobby, back home in Texas, knew that he had a de debt to these women as well. And so he steered the amendment, the newly passed amendment, through the Texas legislature and made Texas the first Southern state to ratify it. Now, that was saying something because Southern states did not like federal amendments. They approved of states' rights. So for Texas to have become the first Southern state to ratify the 19th Amendment was quite a feather in the cap of the governor and of Minnie Fisher Cunningham as well. So when the rest of the states, necessary states ratified it, um, it became law. The 19th Amendment became law on August 26th, 1920. Now, it's time to talk about that, those elements that may be surprising. As great a victory as that was, 72 years after that meeting in Seneca Falls and over 50 years after the first attempt to get suffrage in the Texas legislature, what I learned had happened, I had to unlearn because what I learned was that uh, it gave all women the right to vote, but it didn't because states still controlled elections. And in the South, the Democratic Party did, still did all of the controlling. So during all of that time, from 1920 to 1965, people of color continued to have their voting rights denied, not only in states, but in Congress, where segregationist Democrats called Dixiecrats wielded enormous power and they weren't going to budge on civil rights. They hadn't cared about the 13th Amendment. They hadn't cared about the 15th Amendment. They really hadn't cared about the 14th Amendment and citizenship all that much. So why would they carry, care that much about the 19th Amendment? <clears throat> so eventually, with the spread of the civil rights movement, more moderate Democrats like Lyndon Johnson begin to support civil rights. And in 1964, after that awful event on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on the march to Selma, when police on horseback bloodied and beat the marchers, the African-American marchers, the United States Congress under Lyndon Johnson's guidance passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act and then the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And so people of color after 1965 finally had the right to vote because of the key issue that Southern states had to have their voting procedures vetted by the federal government to assure that they were race neutral. And so they could no longer simply block suffrage through the 19th Amendment. But in 2013, the Supreme Court decided that was no longer needed. And so it eliminated the requirement of the 1965 Civil Rights Act that Southern states have their, um, have their policies vetted by the government. And so the stories we've been seeing in the news lately about Southern states purging voters from registration records, closing polling places, and intimidating voters are all a result of this decision in 2013. Now, the House passed a bill earlier this year named for John Lewis to reinstate those requirements in the Voting Rights Act. But as of today, it sits in the Senate without any action. And that's where we are now, today, at this moment, at the 100th anniversary of the suffrage story in Texas. We now have to include a wider picture that there were lots of women who wanted to vote who didn't get the opportunity in the first place. And even after the passage of the amendment, they didn't get the right to vote in 1920. And why actually now the suffrage movement itself writ large really isn't over yet until all of those people who have had their votes denied uh, get them reinstituted. And so there you have it. That's the end of the story. Thank you. And thank you, Nancy, for that really wonderful uh, exposition leading us down the road teaching us about so many different ins and outs. If you don't mind, I'd like to start by saying um, again, thank you for reminding us of the women without the vote. Thank you for reminding us that there is no such thing as the women's vote. But um, because I have such an expert here, I'm really interested in that section where you talked about the way in which women suffragists learned about the internal politics of 
the state of Texas in order to advance their cause. Is that something that was a trend begun with the suffrage movement and still is something that women are able to manipulate or use? I, I was quite surprised when my students came to me with stories about the uh, Equal Suffrage League how many men were involved in it, what the politics were within the state. Would you mind just giving us a little bit more on that particular topic? I know sure. it's inside baseball, but it's all right. Baseball, give us, give us <laughs> a little politics, thanks. Well, it's absolutely the case that women were not the only people who, who worked for suffrage in Texas or nationally. They had to rely on men because there weren't enough women uh, in power of any kind. So they had to convince the people who uh, thought it was a good idea, and that had to be men, as we see with the way Cunningham operated with Bill Hobby and with that House member whose name was Metcalf, she understood that they couldn't do it by themselves. Um, I think that it was a long, slow story in Texas because it took a, a long time for women in Texas, in particular white women, who had grown up um, with the culture of antebellum culture and the sort of myths of white frail womanhood to believe that they actually deserved the right to vote, uh, that it was appropriate for women to vote to get into this kind of world that was only something that the men they knew did, and then for them to realize that they could actually benefit from it in the way that, say, women who were members of the WCTU finally learned it, and the way all women who finally supported suffrage uh, learned that it was, there was a competition out there, and if there was anything that they could do to affect the one uh, power card that they had, which was their race and their connection with white males in the power structure, they were going to do that. And I, so I think it's also important to recognize that as soon as suffrage was passed, women started running for office. And the first woman to enter the Texas legislature got there in 1923. They couldn't wait uh, to advocate for. And the state suffrage group became the League of Women Voters. And so what they did was spread the word um, among all of these new voters why it was important to vote. And they continued the education um, campaign that they had initiated in trying to win the vote. And I think the education campaign is such an important part. You're mentioning it's the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And there are efforts all across the country in this very critical time to try and point out what it took to win the vote. I think most uh, students are not aware of the picketing of the White House, of the arresting of women, these upscale women, and indeed that there were women who were force fed, who were injured permanently by their uh, prison sentences, by the brutality that went against this women. And this publicity campaign led of course to have Wilson and the Democrats change their position quite dramatically uh, because of the way in which protest politics highlighted it. Just as in the civil rights movement, um, it's, it's, it's important to, let our students know and our citizens know that people were fighting uh, Bull Connor and they were fighting water hoses, they were fighting men on horseback, they were fighting brutal beatings. Uh, many died in the struggle for the vote and women too struggled for the vote, which is why today it's so important to emphasize that there is no women's vote, but every individual, man and woman, should take advantage of that. Absolutely. And it's also important to know that uh, those women who were considered radical, like the National Women's Party and the women who picketed at the White House, were considered too radical in Texas. And they didn't take off as a group in Texas to support suffrage. And I, I, I think there's also a note from a woman who came to Texas from Iowa in 1884 to ride the trains to give speeches wherever anybody would listen to her. And whenever she came in contact and had the opportunity, I mean, she made hundreds of speeches around uh, Central and, and East Texas for suffrage. Um, she found what she felt was a timidity among Texas women to actually have a voice and speak out. And so 
ironically enough, I suppose, it is the work, the hard work of those women who were considered radicals that really went out and had, they chained themselves to the White House fence and they had parades and they went to prison and they were force fed. And those were the kinds of horror stories um, that began to change people's minds and finally began to give Texas women the nerve uh, to speak up and really become active and vocal. And certainly to have women candidates, a women governor, right. certainly plural, uh, being ahead of the curve. You pointed out about how Texas was behind. And then in some ways, I think we can see um, outspoken women coming out of Texas and making a name for themselves in politics. But I also am concerned, and again, raising the issue, it's something we've talked about, the notion of the woman's vote uh, splitting the suffragists in the 19th and into the 20th century. And we can look even with the uh, memorials going up to women's suffrage, the new statue going up in Central Park that was planned in order to point out the problem that in New York City, a progressive city with lots of statues, there were uh, only fictional women uh, uh, Tinkerbell, for example, <laughs> you know, we, we want real women, real statues. When they decided to put one up in the park, uh, a Stanton and Anthony uh, duo statue was, was, was protested. And now you will have Sojourner Truth, uh, a great fighter for suffrage, joining it. So we are retelling the story in order, as you point out, to include the many women's votes that were sought during this time. And I, I, I'm so struck by the fact that uh, reading uh, some current statistics, you know, feminists were quite outraged in the, the presidential election of 2016 when 53% of the white women in America did not vote for a woman candidate. I am much more outraged and hoping in the 2020 election we can point out that there were 53% women who didn't cast ballots. Right. And maybe the timidity, uh, Texas syndrome is unfortunately a hangover that's, that's with us. I'm wondering also if it's the idea that voter suppression, which has entered our vocabulary and you bring up, is, is such a problem today that it's, um, the vote is taken for granted on the one hand, it's rejected as meaningless because government doesn't respond to the needs in particular of the disadvantaged, of women who are still earning less than men, of women who are still discriminated against. The voters are discriminated against. As Ruth Bader Ginsburg pointed out, when the uh, Shelby case came forward to the Supreme mm -hmm. Court, uh, the uh, Supreme in Chief said that it was an outmoded uh, law because we had changed and these statistics were not uh, really important. And we can look at the fact that Ruth Bader Ginsburg pointed out there have been 700 challenges right. to legal disabilities going forward. And I'm, I'm, I'm really quite struck by that and quite alarmed by it in the current climate. So what, what do you think is a uh, message or a takeaway from our re-examining suffrage? What would you like for people to really be concentrating on and thinking about in terms of the, the, the history and message and legacy of women's suffrage? Well, I don't think that we can overestimate the extent to which the founders, um, the found, our founding documents were based on a misconception that the worth of people was both relative and existed on a hierarchy um, that uh, benefited white men. And that it infuses our basic founding documents. And I, uh, unfortunately, I think that um, getting over that has been difficult for some women. Uh, and one of the reasons I am so pleased about um, the determination of women of color to address issues consistently and continually and not to back down is that they provide guidance for a lot of white women who continue to be a little bit nervous about offending the white power structure in the South. So perhaps we can look at uh, some of the debates going on, history in the headlines, I call it, because we're looking to the issue of a presidential candidate who's declared that he will definitely nominate 
a woman candidate, which would not be unusual. We've had that before, but a woman of color might right. be a recognition of what you and I have talked about, the intensity of black women's activism leading white women forward. Right, and I think actually the, de the demographic moment that we're living in right now underlies this fear among uh, many white um, patriarchal males who are in power that the, com the country is becoming less white. And as we saw during Reconstruction, that was a very fearsome thing to people who had been in power before. And what they did was reinstitute the world as it had existed before the Civil War. I think, I think that impulse is alive and well right now. And so I think we need to be aware of our history that it's happened in the past and it could happen again. And that what we have to do is to, I would say, uh, get in touch with your senators and urge them to uh, reinstitute the 1965 sec the section of the 1965 Voting Rights Act immediately. Uh, it's uh, it's a scandal <laughs> that that happened. Um, and I, I will say when I moved to Texas, I was quite impressed because in the last election, um, and I, I was coming from abroad, I had, I had been teaching in the UK. So coming back and voting, I, I have to say that here in Bear County, where I live in San Antonio, I was so impressed about uh, the early voting procedures. It, it varies so much from state to state. I mean, it's very hard when the current occupant of the White House doesn't know that, that uh, voting by mail is instituted in some states, as you point out. The, the states have control over it. And the one thing I will say is that I both am simultaneously pleased at the ease that you could vote early in the county. Of course, it cuts off. And for those of us stuck in the middle of a pandemic, losing track of time and losing uh, track of space, where are you, Nancy? Where am I? We're all at the Witte Museum. But right. uh, and thank you for reopening Witte Museum. But we're, we're really, uh, you know, losing track. And we're worried about, about people losing track of the possibilities of voting and what is allowed and what isn't allowed. So I am um, very involved with a group of people who are trying to publicize this uh, again. Uh, a new book has come out, Voter Suppression in the United States. And we decided to think about this a couple of years ago and invited, of all people, Stacey Abrams, who had just uh, lost an election in Georgia because of quite clearly the way in which the roles were purged. You mentioned that earlier. So we all have to be vigilant and look at the way in which voter suppression is creeping up on us. I, I hope the media in 20. 20 is vigilant about this, watches it carefully, looks at it, because the, the preciousness of the vote is so important. And that's our job to make people realize it. Texas does have a pretty bad record in terms of, of turnout. Uh, turnout. Uh, and and uh, we, we keep discussing, how can we up this? How can we uh, get people to see how valuable their vote is? Perhaps the way in which the government is going now, that we look to state and city and county and federal government all simultaneously to help us through what is a world historic event. An international pandemic is something quite, quite, stimu quite striking. And the fact that women are called to the foreground as caretakers. It's over 50% of the frontline caretakers are women. It's mm -hmm. quite clear that they are the ones rising to this occasion. I, I could see where there'd be timidity against putting your life on the line for uh, the current situation being so chaotic and dire. Right, and I think we have to take a lesson from what happened in Georgia, when the woman who should have become governor could not become governor because uh, the game was rigged and the man who became governor had been in charge of the voting system in the state. And because of voter suppression, he won. I mean, it's clearly there. Um, it's, in my view, a fraudulent election. And what's coming up in the future, of course, is a presidential election and all of the down ballot races that follow that. And so I'm hoping that this anniversary will help people remind people of the time that it took that there were first generations of women who didn't, and men who didn't live to see it happen because it took so long. And now we have that right and to have it taken away, we must not allow that to continue. 
And I think um, never before in world history, maybe even in Texas history, has the significance of government and its power on our lives been made so stark to us outside of wartime. And so I think, again, the pandemic, the situation with um, an upcoming election in which we're weighing so many issues makes it especially critical that we tell young girls that they face a world that they can change through the vote and through historical examples that we're giving here today that we continue to preach in our classrooms and our organizations in the Texas State um, History Handbook Online on women, which I know you've had an important influence over. It's really significant that we get the word out, we keep the word out, and we can celebrate in August, even if it's only virtually being yeah. together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.